the Wick Harbour Trust collection. The collection is very wide ranging, as with any business collection. It holds records to do with the running and establishment of a business. So there's legislative records. There are governance records, minutes, finance, things to do with correspondence, staff management, building management and repair, things like that. So the normal things you would expect to see from any business collection of the running of an organisation. But then, of course, there are records that are specific to the type of business that they're running. So there are the fantastic Harbour Masters logbooks. There are registers of ships, registers of things that are brought in. So catches landed, fish landings, way books, and a lot of info about equipment at the harbour, repairs to the harbour walls. It's about 37 linear metres of, of collection, covering a a wide time period, but also a wide range of subjects of things that happened in the harbour. Many of the big civil engineering names from across the country involved in it. So Thomas Telford was involved in the original construction. Thomas Stevenson, who was Robert Louis Stevenson's father, famous lighthouse and civil engineer, he was involved in the construction. And also at a later stage, James Bremner, who was a local Caithness architect. The Whit Green riots happened in the 1840s. There's been several crop failures, successive crop failures, and a lot of starvation, a lot of hunger right across the Highlands. But what was happening was while the locals were starving, a lot of the landowners were still producing grain and shipping it out to be distributed and sold elsewhere. So other people were benefiting from local produce while people in the area were starving. And so riots started. It was in February 1847 that things really came to a head in Wick. A group of people started to blockade the harbour so that the ships couldn't be loaded with these local supplies and be sent out elsewhere. And on the night of the 19th of February, it really started to kick off. There was news of a shipment that was going to be going out. And so the crowd blocked the harbour and prevented the ship from being loaded. In actual fact, they filled the ship that should have been loaded with stones and rocks to prevent them putting the grain onto it. As has happened several times through Wick's history, the riot act was read, but the crowd stayed. There were hundreds of soldiers brought in from different places from Aberdeen and an armed guard was stationed around the harbour while the ship was loaded. They kept rioting and eventually the soldiers did a bayonet charge up the street to disperse the crowd. Three people were arrested. They were being marched through the streets to go to the jail and the local people were so angry that this had happened that they were throwing stones down on the soldiers and eventually the soldiers were told just to open fire. And there were several injuries. One of the most serious ones, and this comes to us through our poor relief records, there's an application for relief from a young man called William Hogston. And he was a cooper, so he's a barrel maker. And he has to claim poor relief because he got caught in the crossfire and his hand was shattered. And obviously, being a barrel maker, he needed the dexterity of his hands. And without that, his hand had to be amputated. He had no way of making a living and able to support his wife and his five children. And so he appears in our poor relief records being given around about five shillings a week to live on. Another massive tragedy and crisis hit Black Saturday. This was the night of 18th into 19th of August 1848. By now, there are hundreds of ships operating in and out of the harbour every day. It's a very, very busy port. And they go out to sea in this day in August, what would have seemed at the time to be a fairly normal day. A storm started to blow up. The storm at its peak coincided with a very low tide. And so the boats tried to get back in. But what happened was some of them made it, but many of them got caught as they tried to get back into the harbour. They got caught with a very, very low tide. So of the boats that went, some 18 local boats were smashed on their way back in. So either sunk or smashed on the rocks as they tried to run back into the harbour. There were 30 boats overall that were lost. And it was believed that 94 men were lost, 37 of them 
were Wick locals, so from Wick or the very near surrounding area. And they left 17 widows and 63 children. It's so difficult to imagine the scale of loss on a community the size of Wick and Pontley Town at the time. So there was an inquiry that was run after Black Saturday, and it found that if the boats had stayed at sea, they would have had more chance of survival, because at the time, the condition of the harbour was such that it, it wasn't able to cope with the ships coming in during a storm at a low tide. The harbour was deepened so that the low tide wouldn't have such an effect. There was a radical change in boat design, because up until that point, it was believed that the type of boats operating out of Wick didn't stand much of a chance of survival in a storm like that. And also there was a huge change in equipment. So there was more rescue equipment put at harbours. And one notable thing was the installing of barometers in every harbour in Scotland as a direct result of what happened in Caithness that day. The War of the Orange. And this is from August 1859. This is at the height of the herring trade, so there are 800 boats around about that in every day. The harbour was very, very busy and it was on a slightly small scale. It was a melting pot of all sorts of different people from all across the area and tensions were running very high. There was competition for trade, there was a lot of people in the area and the War of the Orange came about through something very small and escalated into something very big. So it was on the Saturday the 27th of August 1859. Two men, one local young man aged 14 and another man, who started a fight over who was entitled to the last orange in the market and it escalated into a wider fight, more and more people getting involved as the fight gathered momentum. And eventually there were about 300 people involved in this fighting in the streets, brawling in the marketplace. The police arrested a man called Robert MacDonald from Lewis, who they said was the ringleader. And the crowd were furious that Robert MacDonald had been arrested. So as he got taken in to the courthouse, the rioting carried on, people were getting more and more frustrated. And then Donald Mackenzie, who was another Lewis man who was there, he and his crew were so incensed that Robert MacDonald had been arrested that they went to their ship, took the mast down and used it as a battering ram to batter the courthouse. In the evening, Reverend Mackay, who was from Tung Parish, he came out and spoke to the crowd and he tried to tell them to go home, to calm down. And some of them did and many of them did not. And again, the riot act was read. And so the Wick Harbour Musters logbook reads like this. A serious riot in Bridge Street, Wick, the town besieged by Highlanders. The riot act read and constables sworn in, which had the effect only of irritating the infuriated men, many of the thoughtless young lads in the place furnished with batons. Magistrate is taking every precaution to protect the inhabitants. These locals in Wick are talking about the Highlanders as something other. Very clear cultural divide within the highlands about the people who kind of associate with the gales and the people who don't. So this was Saturday. The minister, as I say, spoke to the crowd, tried to calm them down, and to some extent they did. And Sunday, the harbour master says the greatest decorum was observed. And that, of course, is because it's the Sabbath. So the community are trying to not overact on the Sabbath. They're trying to be respectful to it. But any feeling that this had kind of eased and ended is not true because on Monday morning, immediately they regrouped and the harbour master reads, Rioting began this morning at 9.30am. Numbers of Highlanders thronging Bridge Street and threatening vengeance against the parties using batons on Saturday evening. Numbers were maltreated in High Street and Bridge Street Wick in the fore part of the day. The mob thereafter concentrating in great numbers in the Shore Street and MacArthur Street, Pulteney Town in the afternoon. Upwards of 22 persons struck and abused before 6pm. No available force able in any way to check the violence offered. In order to kind of try to defuse the situation, they released the prisoners they'd taken and they released Robert MacDonald, the Lewis man. The army reservists were called in, special constables were sworn in, and by the 31st of August, there were 270 special constables carrying out 13 patrols around the harbour and the town. And on the 2nd of September, these numbers were augmented by 100 soldiers from the West Yorkshire militia who arrived by sea and were pulled in to try and support the authority in the town. The extracts over the next few days for the Harbour Master's logbooks say 
that there is rioting of a very serious kind, people are brandishing their knives and their weapons, and that there is a huge risk of many people being mortally wounded. They attempt, after things start to quell this uh, gradually over time, the locals were so horrified by what had happened in the town that they gave up their weapons. Gradually the boats leave, the boats go back to Lewis and other parts of the Highlands and the tension starts to drop. There was an attempt to re-arrest Robert MacDonald, but he escaped and by all accounts escaped. And on the road out of Caithness, he overrun a, a carriage who didn't pick him up, pushed him out to the side and took the carriage and got back to Lewis where he was re-arrested, but apparently later on escaped again. Tensions kind of diffused and by the 14th of September, the patrols had stopped and the situation had calmed. By the 1860s, as a direct result really of that storm and other storms where it was seen that the harbour wasn't suitably protected to look at, it wasn't safe enough, it wasn't a safe haven, that there was decided to install a breakwater. A long piece of masonry or rubble that's put out into the water to protect the storm surges. And it was Thomas Stevenson, father of Robert Louis Stevenson, who was charged with the design of the breakwater for Wick Harbour. He had done a calculation that worked out what the height was needed of breakwater and the fetch of the wave, so how far it reached forwards. And he calculated from that what he thought the breakwater design should be. And it was quite innovative. He calculated it on a wave that was typical elsewhere, but didn't take into account the height and strength of the waves in Wick Harbour particularly. So the construction started in 1863. He felt that there needed to be a north and a south breakwater and a safe channel in the middle for the ships to come in. It obviously took many years to construct and it was around about nine metres deep, about 15 metres wide, and it was made of a rubble base with blocks of stone on the tops with tons and tons of weight. 1870s, so only a few years later, much of it was destroyed in a storm. There were extensive repairs and additions of concrete blocks and trying to strengthen it, trying to change the structure of it. But by 1872, again, a huge storm destroyed large swathes of it. Foundations were destroyed. The concrete topping that had been put on it was ripped away, extracted from the Harbour Master's logbook. This is 18th of December, 1872. And he says, The sea was never seen running higher in Wickby. Many spectators watching the action and results of each succeeding wave on the new harbour works, and as every wave threatened to engulf the whole structure, stones of five ton weight were being tossed up from the back onto the platform, and the next sea carried them into the basin of the harbour. The very shore was trembling by the vibrations. At 11.30, signs were but too evident that the works were yielding to the dreadful pressure. As the waves receded, openings could be seen between the rubble work and the concrete. The gale continues unabated and the roar of the waves is quite deafening. And then the next morning, he says the extent of damages sustained at the new harbour works can now be better estimated, although the storm is nothing abated. Yet it can be seen that about 50 feet or more of the last finished portion is overturned to the low water mark and the immense concrete block of not less than 800 tonnes has been carried bodily into the basin. Again, there are some repairs carried out, but then in 1877, another storm wiped away the entire end of the breakwater. And it's estimated that 2,640 tonnes of concrete were destroyed and ripped away. And eventually in 1877, the whole project was abandoned and it had cost around about £132,000 for this 10 or so year period where they had just tried and tried to get it right. And in the 1880s, an engineer called James Barron successfully built a breakwater. There were some breaches over the years, but by and large, it was a very successful breakwater and certainly made up <laughs> for the issues that had been caused by Stevenson's. the trawler riots of 1885. There had been gradually an increase in trawler fishing. So of course, trawler fishing is dragging a net along the bottom of the sea. It can produce a very substantial catch, but it can cause damage to the bottom of the sea and can capture fish that are immature and not yet ready to be taken in. And so in 1883, it starts to be noted more and more that the trawlers who are looking for new supplies and new catches are trawling the Caithness coast and they're causing damage and they're taking away from local fishermen's trade. So they're taking the stocks and they're causing damage to the local tradition of line fishing. And so by the 3rd of April 1884, a meeting was called in Leibster to discuss 
what was going to be done about this. And so it was local fishermen who attended, curers from the herring industry and representatives from the churches, because their frustration was that the trawlermen were fishing on Sundays and that this was not appropriate. And again, the tensions between the trawlermen and the local fishermen escalated. There was an occasion in 1885 where the trawlermen, there were several ships came in, several trawlers came in and were stoned. So local youths threw stones at the trawlermen to try and get them to not be able to unload their catches. There was legislation passed around fishing, but some of these pieces of legislation exempted trawlers, and that obviously caused frustration as well. So March 1885, this starts to come to a head, and the line fishermen had had several unsuccessful days of fishing, and they claimed that this was due to all the trawlers who were taking their catches away and taking their lines away. And so the Harbour Master's logbook for this date reads, Great excitement prevails about the harbour today. The steam trawler Royal Duke arrived with about £30 worth of fish and proceeded to land them at the North Quay. As this was proceeding, a great number of fishermen gathered about, determined not to allow the fish to be sold or to boycott the buyers who tried. Mr John Munro proceeded to route the fish, to auction the fish, in the midst of a great uproar. And while in the act of doing so, he was mobbed and run up the quay by angry crowds of fishermen. The rest of the fishermen taking the fish and throwing the boxes and everything into the harbour. The buyers were also badly used, one of them being badly cut. Two of the trawlers hoisted their ensigns and the coast guard and police arrived. Later on, the trawler Miss Roberts arrived and was met by a howling mob with stones. So he goes on to say the Miss Roberts arrived, the dewdrop trawler arrived and all of them were met by local fishermen throwing stones at them, preventing them from unloading their catches. Overnight, this continued, so there was many stones thrown at these ships and the crews of the trawlers hid inside them. And there's even one point where the harbour master said that even he was in danger because he tried to prevent this happening. And one of the trawlers, the dewdrop, eventually fired blank shots into the crowd to try and disperse them. A few days later, the trawlers started to leave. They started to fish further out and they started to not be treated in the same way. There were five or six of the local rioters were arrested, but they were reprimanded and nothing else happened. And subsequent days in the Harbour Master's logs show that trawlers come and go, but there's never again that same climax of emotion takes place. So they must have found some way to work together and, and ease the tensions.